All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Can everyone on see on the screen? It says welcome, and it shows you how to do live, uh, find your live interpretation. So welcome to Randolph's third in a series of discussions surrounding health equity and outreach during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for joining us tonight for what I expect to be an interesting, transparent, and informative discussion surrounding vaccine and health equity in our community. First, some health housekeeping items. Live interpretations available in Haitian Creole, Vietnamese, and Spanish. Closed captioning is also being utilized through the Zoom platform. Thank you to ASG, our state-provided PR company who enabled us to offer these important features and also helped with marketing. The Q&A feature will be active during this presentation. If you're watching on Facebook, once we get that going, we're gonna get the, uh, we're gonna monitor comments and we will answer all of your questions. Make sure you put them in the Q&A or in chat or in Facebook comments. Currently the Vaccine Equity and Outreach Committee in Randolph meets twice a month. You're welcome to join us. The meeting invite is on the town calendar on our town website, www.townofrandolph.com. And tonight we are joined by some amazing panelists, but I'll let our moderator properly introduce those esteemed guests. I will, however, take a moment to introduce our moderator, Randolph Town Councilor Ken Clifton. Councilor Clifton is in his sixth term serving as Randolph, Massachusetts Town Councilor. He holds many degrees and certifications, including a post-law degree. He also has received several local and national awards, including the Martin Luther King Social Justice Award. Councilor Clifton has been at the forefront of our vaccine outreach and equity campaign in Randolph, attending meetings, hosting these forums, and contributing his expert opinions, ideas, and out-of-the-box thinking to our efforts. We are very lucky to have someone as dedicated and community-minded. It is my pleasure to introduce Councillor Ken Clifton. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for your very kind words. And thanks to you, the departments of... Sorry? Thanks to the departments of health, fire, police, the Medical Reserve Corps, all the volunteers for the amazing work you do to keep us all safe. We are forever grateful. I extend a warm welcome to our panelists, including our featured speaker, Dr. Sabrina Asamu, uh, Dr. Eno Mondesir, Councillor Katrina Hoff Lamond, Pastor Kiki Florisson, and Mr. Andrew Sharp. I also welcome our viewers on Zoom, Facebook, RCTV, Radio Concord, Radio Planet Compa, and others. So we are back here once again to share pertinent information and to engage our residents in a collaborative effort to fight this dreaded disease. The most recent data has shown that since the pandemic began in Massachusetts, we've had some 710,000 confirmed infected persons and about 18,000 deaths. And locally here in Randolph, we've had some 4,000 infections and 71 deaths. And I pause at this moment to extend our condolences. So what the broad data does not show, however, is the disproportionate impact that the pandemic has had on communities of color. Clearly, there have been horrendous inequities in terms of those tested, those infected, those who have died, and now those who are being vaccinated. Now, we've made tremendous progress and have become one of the most efficient vaccine clinics in the state. However, disparity persists among certain groups, but we are facing these challenges head on. To date, uh, about 52.7% of our residents have been fully vaccinated, and we're inching closer and closer to the state's average. A demographic breakdown of our own population here in Randolph of the fully vaccinated shows the following. 60% of our Asian population, 46.3% of our Latino population, 69% of our white population, and about 35% of our black population. This breakdown is especially crucial, uh, particularly uh, for marketing purposes. So yes, there is some disparity, but working together, we can meet these challenges head on and win the fight against COVID-19. 
So this evening, we could not have had a better qualified and a more uniquely qualified and suitable panel than we have this evening. As far as the format is concerned, after the presentations by the panelists, the questions we have received during the process would then be addressed. So our first panelist, Sabrina Asamu, MD, MPH, is our featured speaker. Dr. Asamu is an assistant professor of medicine. Sorry, Dr. Asamu is uh, an, att an attending physician in the section of infectious diseases at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Asamu obtained her medical degree from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. She then completed a combined internal medicine pediatrics residency at Brown University and an infectious disease fellowship at Harvard University's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. During COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Asamu has been involved with efforts to increase vaccine confidence, including the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Trust the Facts, Get the Vax campaign. Dr. Asamu. Thank you for having me here tonight. And thank you for this wonderful introduction. I'm really delighted to be here today. And as previously noted, I am an infectious disease physician at Boston Medical Center, Boston University School of Medicine. So first of all, to start off my statement, I'll first start with an overview of where we are right now. So in Massachusetts, we're actually in a better place than where we were. Some of the latest numbers show us that, you know, um, yesterday, for instance, there were 93 cases of COVID, which is um, much lower than what we had at the peak where we had 4,000 cases in January per day. So we're doing much better. A second number that's helpful to look at is the test positivity rate. We're now less than 1% at the state level, which is all really great. And the reason why we're able to have these numbers at the state level is because of the vaccines. The vaccines have been shown to be safe and effective. But unfortunately, as were mentioned earlier, there's been um, disparities um, that have been seen and communities of color, which have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, are unfortunately not being vaccinated as high as higher rates as some of the other groups. And this is why I'm here tonight, because I would like to answer any questions that people may have and try to build confidence in the community so that we can get everybody vaccinated into the other side. So we can all get back to the, to the new normal. One of the reasons why it is even more important today is you may have heard in the, in the, on the news about the variants that are coming out. The latest one that's been all over the news is the Delta variant. And the reason why we worry about it is because it is more contagious. So meaning people are more likely to, to get infected if they're exposed. There are also data showing that it may actually make patients sicker. So my message tonight is if you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to worry about the, the Delta variant. And by being fully vaccinated, it means having two shots of the Moderna vaccine or two shots of the Pfizer vaccine or getting one shot of the GNJ. So if you're vaccinated, you're gonna be fine. Unfortunately, if you're not vaccinated, this is going to be a very, very dangerous time for you. That is why I'm, I'm here, so that I can answer any questions that people may have so that we can get every, as many people vaccinated as possible. The other thing that I wanted to share in my closing remarks is, you know, this is, um, although this has been a really difficult time, it's also allowed us to build an infrastructure that's going to help us help improve the healthcare of the community in general. So at Boston Medical Center, we are lucky to have been one of the recipient of one of the NIH grant called a SEAL grant, which stands for Community Engagement Alliance. And this is a grant that's going to help us continue to build vaccine confidence and build an infrastructure so that we can improve the health care of patients in general in the community. So thank you very much for having me here tonight. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your opening statement. Now, the next speaker is Dr. Eno Mondesir. Dr. Eno, as he is affectionately known within the community, is the public health director for the city of Brockton but he's also been an adjunct professor and is one of our spiritual leaders here in Randolph. He holds a master's degree in public health from Boston University and a doctorate in pastoral clinical counseling from Cornerstone University. He has also attended Conwell Theological Seminary and has been the senior pastor of the Haitian Baptist Church of Cambridge. 
Dr. Eno has also served in the Infectious Disease Department of the Boston Public Commission for some 15 years. He's also currently vice chair of the board of directors of the Mattapan Community Health Center, where he has actually seen it all. Dr. Eno. Thank you, Councillor Clifton, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and uh, let me dive right into it. Um, well, let me start with Brockton. Today, we woke up with 11 cases, um, active cases in Brockton. So, which means that um, to come to this double digit, it's a, it's a miracle that uh, I consider it to be. Um, however, if we look at the overall numbers uh, from the inception of from the beginning of the pandemic uh, to date, we have a record number of 14,196 with a total of 435 deaths. Uh, we have gone for over a month with 434 deaths, but over the weekend we had one last death. Um, so far, a little over 54% of the total population of Brockton have been vaccinated and a little over 10% have received partial um, vaccination, which means one dose of either G um, uh, Pfizer or uh, Moderna. Or perhaps um, if we move to fully vaccinated, um, about 40 uh, seven or so a percent of the population have been fully vaccinated, uh, either with J um, J and J one dose, um, Pfizer or Moderna two doses. Um, I have to say that the pandemic has hit hard. Um, if I look at very briefly the the pandemic, because we call it pandemic because it hits wide, far and wide. Uh, as I looked at the Johns Hopkins University um, um, website this morning. They reported a, a total number as of 10 a.m. today, uh, 181,920,675 cases. That's worldwide. Deaths, uh, 3,009,042 cases. So which means this pandemic has it really wide. Uh, so there is a lot of work to do uh, in order to be able to um, reverse course. We are at a point where we don't have that many cases and um, my um, friend, um, Councillor uh, Clifton and Dr. Um, Asumu has, have already mentioned uh, some of the numbers um, statewide and in other cities. So vaccines save lives and they prevent severe illnesses and premature death. But how do they do that? So we need to get vaccinated. Uh, vaccines is the best way to protect ourselves against uh, infections. Um, now, I know many people have a lot of reservations, a lot of hesitancy, but let me say that in the construction of the vaccines, they do use a specific ingredient in order to make sure that we have the best way to protect ourselves. Um, and uh, when they use, when they talk about mRNA, for instance, many of us may already know that in order to put out uh, a specific um, vaccine against a particular pathogen or an organism, sometimes they have to take a dead piece of the uh, pathogen or the organism, in this case, COVID-19. And so to be able to, to, put, to do, to make up the vaccine. But most of the ingredients, uh, as you know, are for specific, very specific purposes. And so as we look at them, um, we can take the vaccines mainly with um, uh, assurance that uh, they do more good, more good than if we did not take them at all. Um, and so let me say that um, vaccines, either Pfizer, Moderna, or uh, JNJ, they all help. No one needs to die of COVID-19 because there is health. Let me close with this. I know there may be any, many people who are listening that may be of faith. Uh, 
one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, and namely Apostle James, when he was reaching out to the Jews who were uh, in exile, but who have been converted to Christianity on the matter of faith, he told them that work, faith without works is dead. And so therefore, I would like to say to all of you who may have some faith and thinking that faith alone may get you over to the other side. But let me say, if you're just simply counting on faith, I have to say, you're not on the, on the right track with this virus. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Eno. Our next speaker is Randolph Town Councilor Katrina Huff Lamon, who is presently serving her third town, her third term on the Randolph Town Council. As a social worker by profession, she brings awareness of equity and equality to all she does, both personally and professionally. She fully appreciates the need for social justice and social change. Council Hoff Lamann is often on the front line fighting against oppression and seeking opportunities for those in need. She holds a master's degree in social work, and she's also an adjunct professor at Simmons University, Boston University, and Curry College, where she teaches courses on racism and oppression, social policy, urban leadership, and human behavior. At the start of the pandemic, she collaborated with Councillor Clifton, I guess that's me, in organizing the COVID-19 Testing Equity Virtual Forum, which was conducted in multiple languages. Councillor Hoflamon. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, my colleague, my friend, how are you and how's everyone? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I truly appreciate being part of this panel discussion and appreciate, you know, my town, Randolph, um, putting such a distinguished um, panel together with some professionals who, um, as far as I see and I hear, are extremely passionate about how do we help others? How do we get the message out? Um, and, and so, and, and that's what we're here for today. And I want to take this in, in a couple of um, in a couple of directions. I'm also going to time myself because I've been told not to go over five minutes. Um, so I will do that. Um, so as I think about this, uh, I want to talk about you know a little bit what's going on nationally and how it has some of the similar characteristics of what's happening here in Randolph. And as was mentioned earlier, I don't think we can continue to have this conversation about the vaccine without talking about the disparities. I think there are many people currently who are saying, I don't wanna talk about disparities anymore. We understand what's happening in the black community. We understand what's happening in the BIPOC community, but you know what, it's a huge piece of if the BIPOC community is going to get vaccinated or not. So we have to face the, what some of the issues are in order for us to go forward and, um, and, and talk to folks in the, in the Black community or communities of color about getting vaccinated. So there were these disparities that were unfolded um, and what, we, what we found out around healthcare and around other oppressions that people of color have not been able to receive the proper care throughout years, something that we've been talking about for years, but it didn't, not until this pandemic happened that it was, it was uncovered and we um, started really paying attention to why are folks of color dying by the numbers quicker than the white Americans. And that was real for us. And, and I want to thank Ayanna Presley, first of all, for pushing that data, because her and a couple of other her colleagues said, we need some data to understand who is this affecting more? So once we find out this is affecting um, communities of color, now it's about the vaccine. And how do we get the vaccine? Now, I, for me, I look at it as a team approach, right? We need communities to understand, individuals to understand that this vaccine um, 
is helpful and you've heard from some professionals that it will um it, 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 it will, it's helpful and will help you get through um, what's happening now with the COVID-19. We also want to address what community the society is doing at the same time. And I, I think it's only fair that, because I, I feel like we're talking about the, the Black community, the BIPOC community need to do this. They need to do this. Absolutely. Something needs to be done. But we also need to hold responsibility in society. You know, what are, what society, what towns, what are cities, what are states doing also to engage the BIPOC community to make it make it trustworthy? Because first the issue was that it wasn't accessible, right? We had the mass site and we had the local sites. And now it is really accessible, especially here in Randolph. We're really proud of what we have grown here in Randolph, where we have a site that is, um, my son got his second shot yesterday, which, you know, I took pictures and we celebrated. We had a good time when he got his second shot. Um, but that's because... I was able to talk to him and have that conversation with him. I'm able to educate him. And I think that's a huge piece of education. What does this mean? Because right now, all we have are the historical factors. So how do we develop a, a, a trust factor for residents to and individuals to be comfortable about taking this vaccine. And that's what I mean about a team approach. It's, it's about the residents being educated enough to learn that this is good for you. It's okay. And then on the other hand, it's about how are we providing that information to residents so they feel comfortable enough um, in, in taking the vaccine. So we have the accessibility and, and now uh, we have, you know, this trust factor. And I think that's a huge piece of what's going on. I think there's so much, so many other things happening, but the trust factor is huge. I want to mention, I, I, I had to look at something. So the CDC says since June 21st, Black and Hispanic people have received smaller shares of vac vaccinations compared to their shared of cases, compared to their share of total population in most states. What does this mean? That the black and brown people have suffered or died. Um, the, the more black and brown people have suffered and died than are vaccinated. And then we, we, when we think about Randolph, which is some of the same um, happening in Randolph, currently here in Randolph, we have, we, there are 57.67% of Black people who have suffered and died from COVID, but only 34.5% are fully vaccinated. That's huge. That's huge. So that's what I said. This is a shared effort. And I know we're doing lots of great work here in Randall, but we have to continue to think outside the box and we have to continue to build that trust factor. And, and like this, pan, this panel, um, this forum is absolutely, um, you know, something that's great that's happening to hopefully bring individuals um, to a level of trusting to take the vaccine. But we have to think about that, those gaps, those huge gaps, and how are we going to prevent, how are we going to provide this information so people will trust us? Because as you said, it saves lives. And we have seen it, we, we are hearing it. Um, and the vaccine has done, has had more of a positive effect on the black community than a negative effect on the black community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hoff-Laman. Our next speaker is Dufour Jean Florissant, known to us in the community as Pastor Kiki. He's a co-founder of Total Health Christian Ministries. As missionary work is a passion of Pastor Kiki, he's traveled to the Dominican Republic, to the Bahamas, and to Haiti, conducting religious seminars for the youth. Pastor Kiki holds an associate's degree in accounting and one master's in divinity and another in practical theology and is a doctoral candidate. He is a small business owner and a community leader 
that host radio and television shows on a diversity of topics, including spiritual, social, and economic issues. He's an advocate for TPS, Temporary Protective Status, and other immigration initiatives. He's the founder of True Alliance Center, which provides vaccine advocacy services and serves on several community boards. Pass the kiki. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Councillor uh, Clifton. It's an honor for me to be uh, with you and also uh, with all the panelists. I'm so grateful. I also have two words. I am blessed and grateful. Uh, despite uh, uh, the ravaging effect of uh, COVID-19, and I'm still standing. Uh, I think it's by God's grace that I'll be able to do that. And I'm just so uh, grateful for my former boss, uh, Dr. Mondizia, uh, regarding HAU. I also chair the Haitian American United Incorporated. Uh, that uh, Dr. Mondizia, yeah, just uh, as the first president for the past 20 years so now. I have the baton of uh, leading that uh, organization as well as the True Alliance uh, Center. As uh, so, very my work is very involved. Wear many hats. So throughout the uh, pandemic, uh, I mean continuously. Right now, never had a chance. I never. I mean, I've heard about confinements, but I never be confined at all because I was uh, uh, extremely uh, just uh, working in terms of assisting uh, my community through unemployment struggle, uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and uh, also uh, COVID-19 education throughout the uh, Haitian radio and, uh, and, and TV, and also meeting with uh, several groups in order to find other resources. We collaborate with different organizations, HAU, IFC, uh, and also uh, uh, Haitian Women Association, Everett Haitian Community Center. So we form a coalition basically as to uh, find ways, meaningful ways to uh, allow our community to, to have access uh, uh, to resources. And I also want to thank uh, the uh, Equity Now and Beyond with all the organizations that want to uh, focus on equity access now and beyond. So uh, I have said before in one of the um, uh, uh, video that I did, it is a miracle uh, when it comes to the vaccine because I've seen firsthand just the, the plight of uh, my Haitian community we hit, that has been hardly hit by COVID-19. I lost my stepmom uh, through uh, COVID-19 I, offici I presided <laughs> over many uh, funerals at uh, the uh, funeral homes because we couldn't get them to churches. So I understood just uh, at the early age, so how critical uh, this virus is, how deadly this virus is, but more importantly also knowing that the high hesitancy that has been taking place within my community and misinformation uh, being spread all over, so the best way is for me just to get involved with different communities group uh, and then to be able to uh, share the proper, the adequate information, but more importantly to see how we can attack that disproportionate uh, resources that you both mentioned uh, earlier regarding the health disparities because I deal with a lot of undocumented families that have access, uh, that have no access to health insurance. And also they are afraid of accessing, even though, though that has a TPS, are afraid to access uh, any public assistance for fear of public charge and for fear of being deported. So we just got to find meaningful ways just to be able to connect them with the right resources, but as well also providing the right education throughout. We know our culture, we know definitely how they gather their information, so we need to counter those misinformations, but the only way we can do that is by bringing a wraparound services, because most of our clinics, we did about more than 11 already, is to bring other resources, helping them enroll in healthcare, helping them having access to food, uh, and also helping them understand what is out there in terms of immigration uh, information and benefits. But more importantly, also connecting them even to the Haitian consular to be able to get the passport done. Uh, so those are the wraparound services we know 
that's how people need and what be the best strategy just to use to uh, definitely just connect them to those resources. So we heard uh, so many uh, just uh, uh, misinformation in terms of uh, opinions being spread out there. The vaccine is there to eliminate black people. Uh, the vaccine uh, would not be safe for uh, young people to, to get it. And I think proper education, ongoing education is extremely necessary uh, for us to, uh, to definitely just attack those misinformation and have more of our people are just vaccinated. Uh, uh, Councillor Lauman just to mention just uh, the percentage of the black that have been vaccinated. I'm sure that this is where we fit in terms of Asians. Same thing happened also in Boston. So we do the vaccines now after churches, basically. We just go into the churches and then have the vaccine right there to making sure that people get vaccinated. It's having the Bible in one hand and having the vaccine in the other hand. And that's the best way, basically, just to get our people to get vaccinated. I'm so glad just to be part of it. Just my work will continue. But with your help, with the collaborative effort of all of you, the Caribbeans coming together, the, the uh, medical experts and the elected officials. And I think that's the key right now moving forward to get at least the 80 or 90 percent of our people vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kiki. You know, before I introduce the last speaker, I would like you, Pastor Kiki, to, to clarify or to emphasize something that you said earlier that was most profound. You mentioned that if someone's status is the TPS or even undocumented, they should still go and get the vaccine. Can you please reinforce that? Yeah, absolutely. During the uh, former administration, you know, just uh, immigrants uh, were facing uh, just uh, a fear of uh, 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 even going out, especially the undocumented. And also even documented immigrants were fearing so much uh, because of the glare of the administration against the anti-immigrant uh, policies that have been just uh, 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 on the table. Just so, so many uh, uh, executive uh, uh, that have been done in terms of regulations uh, regarding immigrants were extremely crucial and terrible. So therefore, the immigrants were afraid of accessing the uh, uh, um, any benefits because of the expansion of the public charge that said, if you have access to my to myself, even if you are documented, when it is time for you to petition for family members, you will be barred to do that if you access even housing voucher. So that could be a barrier for you, talking about permanent residents. So looking at the, the undocumented that do not have any legal status yet are afraid to come forward because they said if they come forward, they may be intercepted by ICE and be incarcerated and be deported because we have seen massive deportation of undocumented. So those feel permeated among our communities and we as leaders, we need just to engage them into that conversation and make them understand accessing the uh, uh, public assistance will not be a barrier later on for you just to be able to petition for your family. And then if you come out, we will be there. We're trying to talk to the elected officials for protection. You can come and get access to those services. Thank you. So in short, your immigration status is not an issue. You will not be asked about your immigration status. So please, irrespective of your status, please get vaccinated. Thank you, Pastor Kiki. Now our final speaker this afternoon is Mr. Andrew Sharp. Andrew is the founder and CEO of Authentic Caribbean Foundation, Inc. Andrew is a multi-talented Jamaican American who works closely with Caribbean American communities throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the country in general. He's an accomplished radio talk show host, philanthropist, nonprofit professional, and is an advocate of Caribbean culture, art, festivals, and all things Caribbean. He's also a convener of African Caribbean Black History Gala in Massachusetts, and has played a key role in creating awareness as it relates to the recognition of June as National Caribbean American Heritage Month. He holds a diploma in tourism and business management 
and has led Authentic Caribbean to being a recipient of several proclamations from various communities. Andrew Sharp. Thank you so much, um, Councillor Clifton. I acknowledge Councillor Hoffman and our distinguished panelists. It is with great pleasure that we are here to discuss this important um, pandemic situation for black and brown community. Um, as a foundation, it is vital that we engage with our community at all level, not just only during a pandemic, but in our general routine of providing support for our community is very vital. We see the data already stated how the this, 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 disappropriate of our community we're not being uh, receiving the support the funding and we have been disappropriately um, by this pandemic a lot of our frontline workers who are Caribbean American black and brown American citizens who have worked in the front line has suffered from this pandemic um you imagine the, the 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 needs of our community especially the immigrant community who most of them has two jobs and don't have time to really go to a clinic go to somewhere that can provide support so as a foundation we said the best way is to reach them where they at we got to look at the, the, the way we communicate and outreach to our community. The approach will never be the same. And now that we'll be moving onward post COVID pandemic, our approach to engage with our community has to change. The paradigm has to change. Um, once again, we heard from Montessero, we heard from um, Catherine, the important key of education. This forum is discussing trusted voices. They look up to us, they hear from us while we're there engaging with them at the supermarket, at their appointment, doctor's clinic, at their hair salon. These are the places that they go and uh, get services so we got to reach them there and it's so vital that we we find out what is happening what's the reason behind persons not taking the vaccine well we spoke about education disseminating proper information to our community is very very vital because we have been stigmatized we have been used as guinea pigs so we have that fear that fear to be, okay, this doesn't belong to us because we're gonna be used again as one of those persons who years ago, we, we know what had happened years ago. So we gotta really reduce the trust factor, you know, providing that kind of support, same the persons, for instance, Haitian speaking to Haitian, Spanish speaking to Spanish, a Caribbean person speaking to a Caribbean person, so they can really feel at that level of trust, at, at that level of, you know what, this person who I'm speaking to, they have my back, they're looking out for me. So that's very, very critical that we educate them on the vaccine, which we have been doing and working with collaborative partnership with the cities and the, the state to disseminate the proper information on the vaccine. Um, there has been a lot of misinformation in the community on the vaccine. In addition to, to that, going just only for vaccine alone will not do it. We got to look at the whole broad picture of their housing, their assistance in food, um, one of the key community that we focus on is persons with disability. How do they have access to get the vaccine? How do we, you know, reach them in that, in that instance? I must say kudos to Randolph on your approach and kudos to the city of Brockton on their approach on the mobile vaccine. Those are some of 
key elements that will get those numbers up and working to provide that information, signing people up, canvassing community will be critical for us to change the numbers of our black and brown community, Caribbean American community. I wanna say thanks to be a part of this great distinguished panel, panel, panelists. And we know that the work will continue. It's not just only the pandemic, but we want to ensure that we provide consistently, like Pastor Kiki, for your community are doing the same, same as us to provide that support, immigration, rental assistance, um, housing, jobs. Those are some of the stuff that we see are affecting our black and brown community. So we want to, to be that supportive um, arm where we walk them in the step. We know some people, they don't know how to fill out the form. Um, as immigrant, we come here, we don't know the system well. So organizations like myself and many other who are on this panel will, will be that brother's keeper guiding our community to provide that kind of support. And then now when they see that, they're more receptive to say, okay, this vaccine is for my community. Let's, let's take it. And also we need to remind them, especially in the Caribbean community, it's not the first time we're used to vaccine. When we were baby, we did um, mumps, rubella shots. We did all of those shots. We did immun um, immunization. Um, promotion in Jamaica, I remember I had to take those shots, measles, measles, measles and mumps and rubella shots. So they are familiar with vaccine, but it's to break down the information, provide clarity, and to just be that trusted voice to the community will increase the numbers and will eliminate that stigma and that fear from our community. I thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for your very instructive uh, presentation. Now, um, we've got a barrage of questions, which is a good thing. And so I'm going to be asking our panelists to please be concise in their responses. So let's, let's rock and roll. Um, let's start with uh, a fundamental question to Dr. Asimo. How safe are the COVID-19 vaccines and how can you convince residents that taking the vaccine is in their best interest? Yeah, thank you for this great question. Um, so the reason why we know that these vaccines are safe are is that number one, we followed all the usual steps that we usually do to determine if vaccines are safe or effect ineffective. So we have different phases. And what we do is we do these randomized studies where a group of people receive the vaccines and others don't. And then we look to see um, whether or not, you know, the vaccines worked. Um, so we started with thousands of people for the within the different trials. And then after that, when we found out that they were safe and effective, so far, we've had millions of people in the U.S. who have received these vaccines. And from all these data, um, we know that the vaccine is safe. Um, there have been, you know, side effects that have been recommended uh, that have been that have been um, reported. Like, for instance, when I got my vaccine, I had like uh, for just like a couple of days, I had some arm soreness. I felt tired. But those were actually fine because those, and especially feeling tired and a little bit of a fever, those were just ways that my body was making those antibodies that were going to protect me. So the reason why we know that these vaccines are safe is because we've given it to a lot of people. And at this point, millions of people have received it in the U.S. and even more around the world. And, uh, and people have done well. So that's the first thing. And um, what was the second part, sorry, of the question? So they're safe and... Okay, how can you convince residents that taking the vaccine is in their best interest? Okay, so the way that I can let you know, I, I, the way that I can convince you is, I'm not just telling you to take the vaccine because I think you should. I actually took it. I got. I was one of the first people in line who got vaccinated in um, in in December, 
and I'm fine. I've been doing great. I've been recommending to all my family members. And I was so happy when my husband got, got vaccinated. And I can tell you that I can't wait until we have the data for children so that I can vaccinate my two children. So I'm not just recommending it, but I'm actually walking the walk and I'm actually, I've actually gotten vaccinated. Um, and I've been doing fine. And the reason why I got vaccinated is not only to protect myself, but to also protect you know, everyone around us and to protect our communities. Because um, as we're seeing, as I mentioned before, those variants are coming out and the more people we have who are not vaccinated, that gives an opportunity for the vaccine to mutate and become stronger. I'm sorry, the, vac the, the virus to become stronger. So we wanna be able to protect as many people so that, the vac so that we can get back to our normal life. So that is why, um, I, I think that you know that that's all the arguments I would I would like to use. And if 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 me you know I'm I haven't met you the person who had the question, and I would say if you still have questions, please talk to your healthcare professional, talk to your pharmacist, um, talk to other people who are around, talk to family members. You probably have family members who got vaccinated. You can talk to them and ask them for their reasons. And, and see if that's going to help. Talk to your faith leaders. We have pastors here who, I, I really love the line of like, you know, Bible and vaccine. You go to church and then you get vaccinated afterwards. I really, really love how we're bringing the vaccines to the community and finding ways to reach people where they are. Um, so thank you for this question. Thank you, thank you for your response. Dr. Eno, anything that you wish to add? Um, I think Dr. Asumu, um, uh, answered quite uh, eloquently, but I would add one last piece. Um, up to before 75 plus, say 75 years old plus, were eligible to take the vaccines. Uh, the almost all of the deaths occurred around people of 65 plus, 65 years of age and above. Now, once they became available, most of those of them who committed to uh, taking the vaccine have not been um, infected anymore. And two, they're not dying. The deaths that we're observing up till the point where people um, uh, below 65 were eligible, um, those are people who are still, this is the population demographic where people are still dying. Um, and particularly 50, below 50 years old. So, and because I think you find more resistance among that group of individuals. And so therefore, if we look at the upper end of the age bracket, those people are no longer dying because they have been vaccinated. And so therefore, anybody who needs to, um, um, increase their chance of not being uh, infected, I offer the vaccine, please take it. Okay, thank you. A question specifically for Councillor hoff uh, Will educated teens and youth about the vaccine help with vaccine rates of new immigrants because they bring that message back to their parents slash grandparents? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and some of you may know that I um, am a founder of the Randolph Youth Council here in Randolph. And we had a very um, intense conversation about it because I actually, as much as I believe in it, I didn't want to, I didn't want any of the youth to feel as if I was pushing them in one direction or another. Um, especially because I didn't want their parents to come after me. So I was, I was very careful about how to um, share that information. Um, and however, what I, I realized and, and having that conversation uh, with the youth and not only in, in my son's friends as well, is that when you provide correct information, accurate information, um, and, and, and you're not staging fear, F-E-A-R, then people are, they're more likely to want to be part of the solution because we see it as the solution. Um, and, and so once we have a couple of youth who have been successful in going through the process, 
then we have, and, and they tell a friend, and then they tell a friend, and then now you have a generation, a whole generation of youth who um, are taking, uh, who will be open to taking the va uh, vaccine. And even, and not, it doesn't just stop with the youth though, because we're talking about adults, we're talking about youth. I know our town managers gave, told a very interesting story. Um, in Randolph, we have a, a Haitian daycare. And again, we have been putting efforts forward to be mobile with the vaccine. And we went to the daycare and a couple of residents, a couple of members of the daycare did get vaccinated. The others were very hesitant and did not want to get vaccinated. However, when those couple, one, two or three individuals got vaccinated, the others sat there, watched to make sure that who were those who were vaccinated didn't grow an extra head, an extra limb or anything. And when they found that it was that person was okay, that, I mean, they actually called the town for others to get vaccinated. So it's about education. Um, I think many of us have mentioned that if we, if we, if you are able to provide accurate information, uh, people seem to be more interested in the solution and not just thinking about that small percentage that we hear on the news. Well, so, you know, this one person out of a million person had these symptoms or this happened to them. We have to really inform people of the majority, what is happening with the majority of the population uh, when it comes to youth and adults and how this is uh, vaccine is saving lives. Thank you. Um, Andrew, did you have your hands up? Yes, I wanted to reinforce the importance of why this vaccine is good. We have we have um, data and we have supportive evidence. The first person who took the vaccine was of Caribbean American heritage, that Jamaican nurse that took it. She's still alive. She's kicking and doing well. So the vaccine worked. Um, in addition, look at the numbers. If we look last year and remember last year when we were all locked down and the numbers were spiking, now we have the vaccine. We've seen that the numbers have been reducing. The debt numbers are going down. So that's solid evidence that the vaccine is working. The vaccine is good. Um, in addition, I must brag and boast again, Caribbean American was part of the process of making the vaccine so my caribbean folks it got to be good it must be good so it's important that we take the vaccine there's no hesitance because it's there it's showing you proof that you know the percentage of persons who have taken the vaccine it has helped thank you thank you pastor kiki uh, what role does the faith community and civic society need to play to increase the vaccine numbers that we are talking about? Uh, this is actually uh, a very important question. So when it comes to our role as the uh, community leaders and uh, clergy uh, to making sure that uh, our congregants and our communities get access uh, to the vaccine. Oh, not only get access, but trust the vaccine. Because uh, now we have access. There was just a lot of uh, disparities before. Since uh, last year, I advocated for all clergy uh, members to be vaccinated because we're the one who officiated just uh, all the different uh, funerals at different places uh, and serving the people at food pantries everywhere. So we the one we should be. We are essential workers also as a clergy. But I think it it, it, it comes to uh, this point right now that we have access uh, to the vaccine, just uh, for the uh, fifth communities uh, to articulate now uh, uh, a very clear and concise message uh, regarding our creator, who is God, who is omniscient, meaning he, is, he knows everything. He is above all science. He gave uh, ability and capacity for men to study and understand and to administer what's good for his people. And I think that's the message that the fifth leaders uh, needs uh, to articulate in the prophets, uh, telling that we need to get back to normal. Understand that. 
So we are a community of faith. We'd like to embrace. We'd like to fellowship. We'd like to eat together. Just we like, I mean, we have to, we have to lay hands on each other. So therefore, in order for us to get back to normal, we definitely have to get vaccinated and encourage our people just to do the same. Thank you. I have a question here for um, another one for Pastor Kiki. Uh, can you talk a bit about your partnership with the state and how you're helping uh, to reach normally difficult and inaccessible residents? Uh, just uh, I believe that uh, uh, my uh, my friend Andrew Sharp talking about just the homebound uh, just communities that the states are having a number for that and the many. And I believe I um, also thank uh, the town of Randolph that has that uh, uh, um, of, 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 uh, capacity because when I give the information for Randolph, they have a number for people to call if you want to get picked up. Transportation is extremely important. Just working with that. But working with the organization called CSIO, the Center to Support Immigrant Organizing, that definitely work closely with the immigrant uh, organizations, such as uh, the Latinos, the uh, Brazilians, the Africans, and also uh, finding resources to making sure that we have access to resources to provide transportation for our people. And from day one, from the discussion of the COVID-19 distri uh, vaccine distribution, we alluded the best way to, uh, to get to our people is to be able to bring the vaccine where they are, to meet them where they are. So, and I think that's, 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 this is the way that we articulate that when we meet with the city's uh, elected officials, when we meet with the state elected officials, we tell them, and I'm sure that now they have uh, plans, ongoing plans right now to bring the vaccine to all the communities of Coros and we, as community leaders are there to assist in them to promote in that effect. Thank you. Uh, Councilor hoff -Lamon. Yes, thank you. I, I want to emphasize that, um, like Dr. Kiki just mentioned, you know, bringing, bringing the vaccine to where people are at. Like, how important is that? And to me, that is equity, right? So equity sometimes costs more money and takes more time. However, if we really want to combat this uh, virus, then we think outside the box on how we could work, um, be more mobile and bring more resources to individuals, to agencies, as we have been doing, you know, going to churches, which I think has been, been great. Uh, we may only vaccinate 20 or 40 individuals, but those are 20 and 40 individuals who most likely would not have come to the center. Um, so meeting people where they're at. The other thing I wanted to mention that I thought was an a initiative that was wonderful, and I would even like to think about it here. In Boston, when they decided to have local sites, they did a great job in securing the Reggie Lewis. And at the Reggie Lewis, they had um, the doctors were folks of color, the nurses were first of folks of color, the custodians were for, for people of color, those who are opening the doors, closing the doors, writing down the information. That's how you build trust. And so I think part of this is understanding that we, you know, the efforts around equity and, and building trust um, have to also be part of this strategic planning as we continue to do some of the things that we're doing here in Randolph. Thank you. Thank you. So um, from what I'm gathering, so Randolph has been very creative in terms of its outreach activities, going to the, uh, the supermarkets, the homebound program, um, you know, going pretty much to the churches, wherever uh, the folks might be. So access has been improved, but yet the numbers are not improving comparatively vis-a-vis -vis access. So is it a question of access or is it a question of hesitancy or is it both? Who would like to take that question? Oh. Okay, I don't want to take it from anyone, but I have my opinion. Well, let me let me jump in quickly, and then I'll leave the time for the rest of the individual. I think it's a combination, um, or so what we are observing is a synergistic effect. 
some of the, in the mix um, may still don't have understanding how to really access it. Uh, maybe people who do not speak uh, English. Uh, they may be home and they may not have relationship with people who will uh, help them access um, either by calling for them or helping them to get to a specific site. Other people, I think, I don't have the numbers, but I know that there is a sig significant number of individuals who are um, Republicans. Not that I am, uh, I have anything against political parties, but I think when we look at the statistics, there is a significant number of young white, uh, young white individuals who do not trust vaccine, who believe that maybe the vaccine or COVID itself is a hoax. Um, so that's the second issue. Now, I said at the closing of my statement of my presentation that uh, faith um, doesn't get you or faith alone doesn't take you over COVID because you still have some people in church who have some hesitancy, who feel that, okay, faith will help me. I pray a lot. But the reason I mentioned James, because he was talking, he was pointing out the very issue uh, where people thought that, okay, then if I have faith, then that's all I need. I don't need to do anything, anything else. It's like saying, okay, I am a Christian or I believe, so I don't need to eat anymore to provide energy for my cells, for, the, for my body to function. We have faith, but we still eat. And so if we're sick, we can still have faith and still take the vaccines. I'll stop here. Thank you. And I also want to uh, add uh, some of the uh, sayings because uh, some of our people get the information from the University of WhatsApp. And that has been uh, really- uh, That's the, UW. The, That's UW. <laughs> the biggest instructor. And then we just, we, we were working with a, uh, an assistant researcher uh, from Boston uh, University that's come up, that came to one, to some of our uh, vaccine clinics and interviewed the people. And some of the answers they have, this is they have fear that the vaccine was a political scheme, that no one in the U.S. could be trusted, and that it was the mark also being of evangelicals, is, is, the vaccine is the mark of the beast. A uh, very pervasive mistrust in the purpose of the vaccine. And then they just as University of WhatsApp stating that J&J had killed uh, thousands of people, which is not true. This is our misinformation. So historical background also on this, not surprising, warranted, that's what we can say. Uh, but we need to find a way to address that to those people. There's a really misinformation that has been permeated throughout our uh, immigrant communities. So we're trying to uh, definitely let the undocumented to come and get vaccinated and tell them they need no health insurance. They need no immigration status just to come the vaccine. It's this information we have to continue to making sure that we have our numbers increase. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Asimu, uh, there's been some confusion. Uh, does the vaccine stop transmission of the virus? Please clarify. Yeah, so what the vaccine does is that, um, so when someone is vaccinated, the reason why we want people to get vaccinated is that what, when you're vaccinated, if you're exposed to the virus, you're less likely to become sick from it or transmit it to someone. So if you take like the mRNA vaccines, for example, when they did the studies, like either the Moderna or the Pfizer, they were about 95% effective. So meaning if you get exposed to the virus, you're less likely to get sick. So now when you're vaccinated, you may have heard of, you know, people getting still getting vaccinated and still getting infected. So some people are thinking, oh, well, if I'm going to get infected, then why should I get vaccinated at all? But the deal is that when you actually look at the, the cases, the, the number of people who still get infected despite getting vaccinated is really, really small. It's like less than 1%. It's really, really small numbers. And the other thing is when you get vaccinated, even if you, um, you get infected, you're less likely, as it was mentioned before, getting sick from the virus, needing to be hospitalized, needing to be in the intensive care unit, or even dying. So, um, and then another thing is when you get, when you're, when you're vaccinated, even if you, you were to get the infection, you'll have mild symptoms, you know, 
if, if you were someone who, you know, if you were not vaccinated, you may have gotten really sick and even needed to go to the hospital. COVID may just turn into like, you know, having a cold, having cold symptoms and not being able to transmit um, to other people. So the vaccine is really good at protecting you from getting sick and also protecting you from transmitting the virus to anybody else. So it Thank you. you. Follow up question. Uh, as the summer is upon us and COVID protocols are being relaxed, there are concerns about the new COVID-19 Delta variant, which is spreading rapidly around the country. How concerned should we be and what actions should we take? This is a great question. I love this question. So, um, so my, as I mentioned before, if you're vaccinated, so meaning you've had your two Moderna shots or your two Pfizer shot. It's really key that you get the two shots because the studies are showing us that if you get one, I mean, it's not good enough. You need to get your two shots. Or if you get one of your J&J vaccines and that means you're fully vaccinated, I would not worry about the Delta, vir- the Delta variant that people keep talking about. You're vaccinated, you're going to be fine. However, if you are not vaccinated, that's when you should actually be really nervous and scared of the Delta variant. Because as I mentioned before, it's more contagious. You're more likely to get it if you're infected, if you're if you're exposed. The data are showing us that it could make you sicker. So you'd be more likely to need it to go to the hospital or making, you know, causing you to die from COVID. So the message is if you're fully vaccinated, you don't really have to worry about the Delta vi- variant. But if you're not, it's actually increasing your chances of getting COVID or dying from COVID. And that is why it is so critical. That's why I'm here tonight, because there's all this stuff going on around in the news. But I want to tell you, if you get vaccinated, you'll be fine. But if you're not vaccinated, try to get the information, talk to your doctors, talk to your healthcare professionals, talk to your ministers, talk to anyone who can give you that information so that you'll feel comfortable getting vaccinated. Thank you. Councillor Hoffleman. Now, only 35% of the black population in Randolph is presently fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. There is gonna be increased concentration in getting our students, our youth vaccinated. Um, About 75% of our students are black students. Does that mean we expect a similar disproportionate number of our youth vaccinated? I would say absolutely until unless we take some, you know, um, follow instructions from um, all of the all the panelists here. um, Why would it be any different? Um, Nationally is very the threat is pretty common. That's what's happening. And in Randolph. So as you mentioned, We have about 70% of our residents that are vaccinated. Um, 30% of those that 70 are black folks that are vaccinated, that have are fully vaccinated. Those who have maybe the one shot, one dose, it might get closer to 40%, but that's still a huge gap. And so the information that is being um, presented to our youth are the same individuals who are hesitant about getting their own vaccine, uh, getting vaccinated. What can we do about it? So, well, part of that is how do we give out accurate information? Some of what we're doing, I told you, I really love what Boston did. How do we be proactive? How do we get into these homes, continue getting into the churches? I mean, we're canvassing, we're doing, we are doing many things, but I think we have to up it. We have to push it a little bit more. Maybe having more people in the community. Uh, But we definitely have to understand what the problem is understand the mistrust, why the the mistrust is there, and how do we combat that mistrust? Andrew, real quickly, we're running out of time. Andrew. Sorry. One of the key elements to this is proper nutrition 
and proper hygiene. We must consistently stress that amongst our community. Black and brown community has been affected not just only by COVID, diabetes, stroke, all of these health factors. So we got to ensure that we are informing our community on the importance of proper nutrition, um, supporting local farmers market to get local products that will, will help the body, um, washing hands, doing the ba going back to the basics so that we don't fear that if there's another virus or something, we are prepared. Also, preparation is the key pandemic is a disaster. How are, how are we in terms of our household prepare for a disaster? Do we have our first aid kit? What do we do in terms of a pandemic? Those are critical things that we got to educate our community on and ensure that they have these proper information. They are ready for another pandemic to happen. Thank you. Uh, a public notice. Um, we have weekly outreach clinics, as well as our regularly scheduled ones at RICC. And we're adding the buses in July for regular pop-up clinics at community events, kind of like the artisan market. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes and I wanna give each, each member of the panel to take a few seconds and make any last second comment that you wish to. I'll start with Andrew. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being a part of this discussion to inform and educate our community. I just want to say to everyone who is on Facebook and who is whatever medium we're being streamed on, it is important that we take the vaccine. Let us not wait until the door is shut and then we are left out. As what Shirley Chisholm says, Let's have a seat at the table. If we don't have a seat, we'll bring our folding chair. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Kiki, 30 seconds. Well, uh, thank you so very much. I'm so grateful just to be among uh, all the uh, distinguished panelists uh, uh, conveying the right in information. But one thing that I'm afraid of is the fact that uh, the uh, nation of Haiti doesn't have access to the vaccine. And we have just the people traveling from Haiti back and forth. So then just the people who are here, Haitians who are here, I'm encouraging you, I'm begging you, I'm urging you to get vaccinated as soon as possible so that you can protect yourself and protect the people around you. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you. Dr. Eno, 30 seconds. Thank you, Councillor Clifton. And uh, it's uh, an honor to be with all the great panelists and all the listeners. And uh, also, thank you, Pastor Kike, for uh, all your support. I uh, would like to simply say um, we're not out of the woods. The numbers may decrease, but with um, Delta vir uh, variant and the change in, uh, um, in behavior, may put many of us at risk. And so therefore, let us continue to be cautious and take the vaccine wherever and whenever we can take that. That's the best coverage. That's the best insurance we have against COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hoffman, please stand so we can see your shirt. This is a uh, thank you to uh, one of our town activists, uh, Jahira Lopez, who made these shirts for, for us. It says, Randolph, let's get vaxxed. And that's all I really want to say. Um, as was mentioned, we're not out of the woods. I actually spoke to someone in the health department today, and it was mentioned that Black families are the only um, individuals or the only families that are coming in to get tested and they're positive. So we're not out, out of the woods and we'll still have a large portion of positive individuals um, with COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our distinguished featured speaker, Dr. Asamu. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here tonight. It was really a delight to be here. Um, it's been a long year. We've really suffered 
the reason why I'm here tonight is because I've seen so many and treated so many patients who look like me who were dying. And I thought, I think it's really important for me to be out here to be able to answer questions and to really try to build confidence with these vaccines. They're like our way to get to the new normal. So I urge you tonight, if you still have questions, please talk to your healthcare professionals, talk to your faith leaders so that you can get your answers and so that you can get vaccinated and be safe and protect yourself and protect your family. And most of all, protect, protect the whole community. Thank you. Thank you to all of our distinguished panelists. Thank you to our viewers and to RCTV and others. I hope this forum has been informative and instructive. Personally, I want to thank uh, Liz LaRosie for her close and collaborative work and support. Thank you and good night.